Good evening, and welcome to the beautiful surroundings of the Sheldonian Theatre for the Centre of Personalised Medicine's annual lecture. The first time since 2019 we've been able to hold such an event in person, so it's really great to see so many people here tonight. I also welcome people who are joining us via the live stream. I hope there's lots of you there. Um, my name is Annika Lukeson, and I'm Director of the Centre for Personalised Medicine, or CPM. And I'm also Professor of Genomic Medicine here at the University of Oxford. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to briefly introduce the CPM to anyone who is not familiar with it. So we are a communication, engagement and research initiative based at the University of Oxford as a joint venture between the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics and St Anne's College. Our aim is to examine personalised medicine from a range of perspectives and engage with the overlapping categories of students, clinicians, scientists and the public. We host meetings, talks, events, a blog, as well as short video vlogs and animations. You can find recordings of our previous talks, including those by Jennifer Doudna, Heidi Rehm, and Adam Rutherford, and many others, on our website. Please also follow us on Twitter, at CPM Oxford, to find out about our activities and events, or contact us if you want to be involved in any way. So this evening, we're really delighted to welcome Professor Andrew Hattersley to deliver tonight's annual lecture. Andrew is Professor of Molecular Medicine at the University of Exeter and a practicing consultant diabetologist at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. He trained in medicine, <coughs> excuse me, at the universities of Cambridge and Oxford. His postgraduate education was in London, Oxford and Birmingham. Working together with Professor Sean Ellard, he has taken Exeter from being a centre with no genetics laboratory in 1995 to now being the top international laboratory for monogenic diabetes, with over 20,000 referrals from 105 countries. They've discovered 25 genes in which variations cause monogenic diabetes. Importantly, Andrew and his colleagues have gone from gene discovery to finding the best treatment for monogenic diabetes. They've shown that the commonest form of both familial genetic diabetes and neonatal diabetes can be treated with tablets instead of insulin, resulting in better blood sugar control. His recent work has focused on precision diabetes, identifying subgroups in type 1 and type 2 diabetes with different treatment responses. Andrew has published over 600 papers with 90,000 citations, given over 350 national and international lectures, and received many international and national awards for his work, including being appointed as a Fellow of the Royal Society and being awarded a CBE. I first met Andrew in the early 1990s when I was starting my research into the genetic factors of type 1 diabetes, and I think Andrew was just finishing um, his PhD. I've followed his career in Exeter with awe, and recently met again through being on the board of UK Biobank. He has an enviable ability to translate laboratory findings into real impacts in clinical care, and his wisdom in all parts of the pathway is clear for all to see, and I'm sure will be very evident tonight. Andrew's lecture is entitled Precision Diabetes, the Next Advance in Patient Care. As is customary in these annual lectures, we will have no formal Q&A um, afterwards, but Andrew said he's happy to hang around for informal discussions um, should you wish to pin him down at the end. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Annika. It's lovely to be back in Oxford, and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's, uh, it's a great privilege. There's a little extra bit I've added there, which is to the title, which is that found science can help personalise care. And uh, that's 
really, I think, is another way of saying that I've been very lucky, but I want to try and show you how found science is really critical as well as hypothesis-led science. Hypothesis-led science is what clever people do. What they tend to do is to start up with a very clear idea of what they want to achieve. They would like to treat cystic fibrosis, and they then will continue to take the blank canvas and to decide where they, how they're going to draw their picture. Now, there may be sketches that they do that it's based on. They may get inspiration from other artists, but at the end of the day, they start off with a bank canvas and they've got a pretty good idea of where they're going. And if they're lucky and skilled, they're able to end up with a picture. And that, I would say, is like hypothesis-led science. But there is another type of art than the classical approach, which is found art. And probably most of you are not very aware of that. You might see this as a bit of driftwood, which indeed it is, a bit of driftwood from the front of a boat. But Graham Rich saw it completely differently, and he turned it over and added a boat, and suddenly he created a seascape with a boat going on the sea and capturing those Devon dark skies above and the, the, uh, the marshes running up to the boat. And so this was, was art that came from the piece of found material. He didn't have a hypothesis to start with, he found something. I think actually in science we're often finding things and those are often unexpected. I'd like to try and show as I talk through the different aspects of personalized medicine and precision diabetes that we, we can come across these different approaches. So what I'm broadly we're talking about in precision diabetes is an idea that you take a broad clinical category, you divide it into subtypes, and those subtypes are worth doing because they have different clinical courses and different treatment responses. And clearly, that is a benefit if you couldn't do that when you were just dealing with the broad category. And what I'd like to do is to start with the, uh, the easy, the, the MODI, and the neonatal diabetes, the monogenic types of diabetes, and then finish with the difficult and more complex type 2 diabetes, and show how I think that we need different approaches when dealing with type 2 diabetes than we've used before. Now, as some of you will know, I was advised to, uh, to study maturity and set up ages of the young by three very, very smart people. John Bell, John Teld, and David Wetherill sat in a room and said, if you want to find genes, it's best to look where there's genetic diabetes, where there is a single gene, and don't do the complex type 2 diabetes. I must admit, I was disappointed. I'd hoped to find the gene for type 2 diabetes, but reluctantly agreed it was a, a good place to start. And so what I did initially was to collect families with maturity onset diabetes of the young. Now this was, this is a bit of found science from Robert Tattersall. He was doing a thesis on the complications of diabetes and he came across this family. And when he came across it, he noticed that it was very familial. The bride had been diagnosed at 13, the bride's mother at 17, the bride's grandmother at 23, the bride's mother's cousin at 12, and the bride's two uh, second cousins both didn't have diabetes when this picture was taken, but by the time they were nine, both of them had diabetes as well. So he recognized this was autosomal dominant. He also recognized that it wasn't insulin dependent, although they were slim and diagnosed young. And that was because Mrs. Uh, Mason, who's the lady at the back with the hat, she said to him, I take the winter off. I don't have insulin for three months in the winter. And instead of ignoring that and telling her that she was wrong, he took this bit of fan science and realized that they still had some beta cell function, and therefore it was a beta cell gene, which whilst they needed insulin to control their glucose, they didn't need it for life. And it was really his clinical description that opened the pathway for gene discovery. And without what Robert had done, we never would have moved on. He also noticed that there was heterogeneity in Modi. 
So that there was, it wasn't just one clinical condition, and there was a bit of a dispute between Lester Day in France, Stefan Fion in America, and Robert Tattersall in the UK. They all seemed to be describing slightly different things. And really the question was, was this that it was different uh, severity of the same disease, or was there actually a different etiology? And obviously in a genetic condition, you can define that, because if it's a different, if it's a different etiology, you'll have different genes. If it's a single etiology, you'll have different mutations within the same, within the same gene. Gene discovery happened, and I was fortunate enough to be here working with Robert Turner and Jim Wainscoat. Um, and actually, the, the first gene to be found was glucokinase. Now, this was very much hypothesis-led science. The person who was critical for it was Alan Permit. Alan Permit decided he thought glucokinase was likely to be a Modi gene. He then found two uh, markers either side of it and gave them both to the French, to Philippe Frogel, and to the English, to Robert Turner, and hence myself, to study it. This was one of those ones where the one in 20,000 chance came up. It was a very good hypothesis, but there was a heck of a lot of other good hypotheses that didn't fail at that time. But what I would say was the real breakthrough for this genetics was the hypothesis three approach, the genome-wide association, which led to the finding of linkage and then the cloning of genes by Graham Bell for the two commonest types of Modi, uh, HNF1-alpha and HNF4-alpha. And these were different, and they were different because nobody expected that these genes had anything to do with metabolism. It was a completely different change. I remember being a stupid, arrogant student and saying it couldn't possibly be because this was a, it was a liver gene, a pattern nucleoside, and also that, after all, the knockout mouse didn't have diabetes. It turned out the mouse did have diabetes, they just hadn't looked properly when they published it as having Fanconi syndrome and producing a large amount of glycosuria. So, really, it was the, the, this was the gene discovery that, that mattered. And then the next question was, were they different subtypes, or was it worth finding that? And what was clear was that they had different clinical courses. Um, and if we look here, we can see the basic one was that the glucokinase had mild hyperglycemia throughout life, whilst the transcription factors started off with the normal glucose, and then it got worse. And the interesting thing was they didn't differ just in their, their severity, but they also, we found that the glucokinase didn't develop any complications. They could have untreated mild hyperglycemia throughout their life. And that was a really good thing to discover because they also had a regulated blood glucose and that meant treatment didn't work. So the fascinating thing was that we found in our studies that you had an HbA1c of 6.2% of whether you're on treatment or not. And when we took people off insulin, the HbA1c remained at 6.2%. So in other words, this was a condition we needed to save doctors from. Without doctors, they did really well. They kept their glucose well controlled, and they didn't get complications, and they didn't take nasty drugs that were only going to give them side effects. But that wasn't the case for the HNF1-alpha, which was the one we saw of the ladies in the wedding that needed insulin treatment. And the difference here was that these patients did get complications, did need treatment. But again, this was a bit of found science, and, and this was sitting in my clinic in 1996, 1997. We just started to sequence the HNF1-alpha gene in our clinic, and one of the very first patients came into my clinic and started to complain that he put on two kilograms in weight. This was a, a young man in, who was 36, and that's the time when men start to worry about their weight. Now, I was a proper evidence-based doctor, and I knew that metformin would control his glucose as well if he had type 2 diabetes, and therefore it, would, and it wouldn't result in weight gain. So I confidently explained to the SHO that I was changing him to metformin because it was good evidence-based medicine, and it was a disaster. It was a disaster because his HbA1c, which had been well controlled at 6, rose to above 10 despite being on a maximum dose of metformin. And so this was going against the evidence base that said in type 2 diabetes, the two drugs were equal. We then swapped them back 
to uh, 5 milligrams of bibenkamide, a single tablet, and their HbA1c fell by 5%. Now, normally, a tablet in diabetes only makes a difference of 1% or 1.5%. So this was a dramatic difference. When we looked at our other patients, we found they all had stories of extreme sensitivity to sulfonylureas. So that was our first bit of luck. The other bit of luck was that the SHO in the clinic was Ewan Pearson, who's that extremely smart now professor in Dundee, and he then took this bit of found science and did the hypothesis-led bit, where he did a randomized control trial. So what he did was take HNF1 alpha modi and type 2 patients and give them either metformin and then by, followed by sulfonylureas or the other way around. And what he was able to establish was that these patients were acutely sensitive to sulfonylureas. What that actually meant was that Maggie Shepherd was then able to take this information and show that these patients could discontinue insulin and get better glycemic control, often on only half a tablet. And so, really what we'd done is to show it was worth defining these subtypes, not only because they had different clinical courses, but because they had different treatment that they responded to and different treatments that they needed. And really, that's led to be, you being used clinically worldwide. It wasn't the genes that were being found. It was the fact that it was clinically useful. And it's also, these are very robust genotypes in that they are, um, you can diagnose them with a, with a monogenic cause, and there's no overlap between the subtypes. And obviously, there's clearly a different etiology between the subtypes. And really, what I would argue, it's, it's been the clinical utility that matters. And it's that different clinical course and different treatment response, which is why now we're delighted to say that NHS Diabetes have said that every single hospital should have a doctor and a nurse who is a specialist in monogenic diabetes. And Maggie Shepherd has arranged the teaching courses for that. And so now this is something that is spread out to every single part of the UK. Just as that was kind of coming to an end, I was lucky to sit down at breakfast with a very charming pediatrician from, from, from the Netherlands, Bru, Jan Bruning, and he told me that he had some people with diabetes that were too young to have type 1. These were neonatal diabetes, like uh, Ella here, diagnosed at six weeks, who had ketoacidosis with a glucose of 54, life-threatening condition, a pH of 7, and uh, it was thought that either this was type 1 diabetes or neonatal diabetes. But at this time, it didn't really matter, because if it was neonatal diabetes, then you would just classify it based on the clinical cause. If it got better, you'd call it transient. If it stayed bad, you'd call it permanent. If there was pancreas wasn't there, you'd call it pancreatic aplasia. It wasn't really helping much. It was just saying what had happened to the patient. It certainly wasn't helping treatment, because they were all insulin treated. That changed with the work of Anna Gloin working in Sean Ellard's lab in, 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 Oxford, in Exeter, sorry. And uh, what Anna did was actually, this again was hypothesis-led science, because it was a candidate gene approach. She was looking for spontaneous de novo mutations, and she picked the right gene. At that time, that was the only way she could have found it, was by picking the right candidate gene. And she did. She found heterozygous de novo mutations in the potassium channel in the, um, in, the, in the beta cell. The reason she chose it was the science that went ahead. She had been working with Robert Turner and with Fran Ashcroft in Oxford, and there had been superb science that had happened about this channel and its potential role in diabetes. And indeed, it was to Fran Ashcroft that we turned having found the gene, and she was able to identify that these patients had a channel which was not closing in the presence of ATP. So the channel stayed open, and as a result, as a result of the mutation, and what that meant was that the beta cell was hyperpolarized. It had insulin there, but it couldn't release it. And what you can see in this diagram is uh, coming in above is that the other thing that can bind to this channel and open it is sulfonylurea tablets, a treatment for type 2 diabetes. So this was, this was something where the finding led immediately to the treatment. As soon as you had found that gene or the, that channel, it was worth trying whether the, the uh, medication of sulfonylurea 
never given to people with type 2 diabetes who made no insulin, because after all it stimulated the beta cells, was worth a try. And the amazing thing was that it was worth a try. The lucky thing was that we tried it in children first, and we were adult physicians, so we ended up giving them a massive dose, actually three times higher than the normal standard dose for an adult. It was jolly good that we did because you needed that dose, and had we started with an adult, we would never have carried on to taking 15 tablets a day when the maximum is three. But with this, what we saw in this uh, consecutive series of the first 50 patients was that every single one, sorry, 90% were able to stop insulin, and of those who stopped insulin, every single one had a better blood glucose and no increase in hypoglycemia. And that's really the golden, what we all want to do in type 1 diabetes is, and insulin-treated diabetes is to get the blood sugar down without going too low. And what you can see here in this monitor of the blood glucose is on the insulin pump. It's not only higher, but importantly more variable. Whilst once they go on to glybenclamide, this is an 11-month-year-old infant, you can see how the glucose basically flat lines. And what this meant was massive for the patients because they were suddenly, they would got used to coping with type 1 diabetes, of thinking at every meal what they were going to do and what they were going to eat. And their parents were used to bitting up at night to test for hypoglycemia to stop it. And suddenly all of that stopped. And they had a more liberal diet, a more liberal activity. This meant things like going on school trips abroad, sleepovers, school, team, school teams. This had a real importance and really shows us why we have to get a cure for type 1 diabetes because of the difference it can make. People worried that it would um, burn out. Just done the 10-year follow-up. What we've seen is the HbA1c has been maintained on all these patients and also, if anything, the dose has got slightly lower rather than higher. So in contrast to type 2 diabetes, it's, um, it's, it's not wearing off. The really interesting thing was that after 750 years of follow-ups, no children had hypos with loss of consciousness or seizures. So they really had managed to, to achieve that. So what we did was to decide to offer this free throughout the world to anybody diagnosed in the first six months of life. And what that meant was 105 countries chose to send their samples to us so we could diagnose the potassium channel. About half of them came off. But the half who didn't come off, we were able to look for new genes, genes that were important in how the beta cell worked, how the beta cells were formed, mechanisms that destroyed it, either immunologically or through ER stress. We were able to look for causes of an absent pancreas. And so what this meant was an ever-increasing number of genes to be discovered, important really for their biology um, as, as much as their clinical value. But there was a clinical value as well, because each of these genes, not only would it determine how their diabetes was treated, but also tell us about other features, about neurological features, bone features. And quite often now, we were diagnosing the syndrome before the syndrome was there. And so actually now you were able to say, at the moment it's only diabetes, but in the future you will have problems with your liver. People are able to plan for it. And so really we have moved to the case where the only test that matters in neonatal diabetes once you have saved the person's life with insulin is to do genetics, to find out how you should carry on, what the disease is, and what cause you should use. So again, it's worked. It's worked because it was simple, it's monogenic, we've defined easily, there's no overlap between subtypes, there's a different etiology, and it's got a clinical utility. And so that sounds good. And it'd be nice to just stop here and you could bask in the fact that you've done this, but it was all a bit long ago, so I do need to talk about some new stuff. And really... The big challenge was type 2 diabetes, where I'd said I wanted to start and to, to go back to that. And if you sit in a clinic, in a GP, you will see very different people coming to see you, very different sizes and, and shapes, and with onset at different ages. 
And the real question is, is it really right that they all should get the same treatment? Should they really all be treated with metformin followed by whatever the next best one is? And, or are there really subtypes that can help predict the clinical course or treatment? So once again, we did turn to genetics, and, and this was the last big paper I was on in genetics. And, and I think it's worth talking about having come back to, to Oxford, because really what the finding of polygenic gene susceptibility is, is the ultimate in found science. That there is no, when you're doing a GWAS scan, there is no underlying hypothesis, except for the fact that if you do have enough samples, you will find something. And indeed, that showed probably by the, the first paper here. The FTO, we renamed it, but it was called the Fused Toe uh, Orthologue because the, there were only 10 papers written about that gene, uh, and they were all to do with a knockout of that region where, people, where mice ended up with fused toes. It didn't seem to have anything to do with obesity. It turns out to be the commonest predisposing polymorphism. And the interesting thing is 15 years after that was discovered, we're still struggling to know exactly what FTO does and what the mechanism is and how it fits with the fact that it can increase your weight by three kilograms, almost entirely fat mass. But the interesting thing that I would point out here is about team science, because that's the other thing I think we should talk about as well as found science. This was working with Mark McCarthy when he was in Oxford, and what we did was that you'll look at the authors there and you see they alternate between Oxford and Exeter. And this was one of the best bits of team science I've ever been involved with. We actually did things in parallel rather than one checking on the, the other or doing different things. And it worked extremely well. And uh, the success was the publication in science. But what I would point out was the other success was the, the careers of the people that were the first, uh, the first joint authors. Tim Frayling is a professor in Oxford. Nicholas Timpson is a professor in Bristol. Mike Whedon, sorry, Tim Frayling is a professor in Exeter. Nicholas Timpson is a pro professor in Bristol. Mike Whedon is a professor in Br Exeter. Ellie Zaghini is now being recruited from Sanger to Munich. Rachel Freethy is a welcome senior fellow in, in Exeter. Cecilia Lindgren is obviously here, running your data science group and as a professor there. John Perry is a professor of metabolic medicine in Cambridge. Catherine Elliott is working here in bioinformatics as a team leader. Hannah Lango is running the human genetics in Cambridge. Those are all people that were postdocs. And really, the greatest thing about this paper is those people, not this science. This would have been discovered a week later or a month later. But actually, what does go forward is those people and the science that they've done. And I think, ultimately, we really need to value that. What's, as I said, this was really where I bowed out of the polygenic field. Um, Mark and others continued. The latest GWAS has found not four loci, but 400. And so we've made enormous progress, but the bottom line has been what makes progress is superb bioinformatics and very, very large numbers of subjects. We would love it to be something else, but it's not when it comes to, to gene discovery. So can we use that information? Can we use that information for subgroups? Well, obviously in monogenic it was easy because you were defining these discrete groups. But really, what about type 2 diabetes? And then I would argue that you've got real problems because it's continuous data. It's clinical, continuous clinical data, continuous genetic data. Not robustly defined or diagnosed. There's going to be overlap. And there's not a different etiology between the different subtypes. But the real question is, can we find clinical utility? And that will mean that we can find a different clinical course or a different treatment response. Life group really did an approach which again was found science, it wasn't hypothesis based, this was a cluster analysis and what he came up with was that he felt there was clusters of four subtypes of type 2 diabetes and then a single autoimmune group. Um, there were problems with that issue but the real question was, was it best to do it this way, to take the clinical features, divide it into subtypes which would tell you the clinical course and treatment 
Or should we take the clinical features and make separate models for the clinical course and for the different treatments? And that's a, a different approach which uh, John Dennis has really um, built up within Exeter. So what he did was to see, well, if the clusters are going to be helpful, then let's see if they work better than the clinical modeling. And uh, what he was able to find was that they were reproducible, that he could find them again in, in individualized trial data, that they did show disease progression. So you can see here the different progression of the HbA1c over time of the, of the five different clusters. But what he also pointed out was actually you could do that with just knowing the age of diagnosis, that there was a doubling in the progression of diabetes based on the age of diagnosis at uh, uh, a difference by 15 years. So we didn't need to put people in a fancy cluster. You could just ask them when they were diagnosed. And then what about choosing treatment? And what he found here was using those same clinical features that had been used to make the cluster groups. Actually, the cluster groups didn't do so well in predicting the, the outcome and the treatment as the clinical features models. In fact, there was no difference, whilst there was a significant difference in the clinical features model. And really, I think what that leads you to wanting to do is to use this continuous data. And really, what we feel is the future lies in modeling the outcome you want. So really going back to the more hypothesis-based science, if you want to predict progression or you want to predict treatment response, use data on progression, use data on treatment response and analyze it that way. And that will mean that you get different things. If you're thinking about why would a treatment vary, it's not just because the patients vary with the different etiology of their disease. It's also, it could be because there are features defining the drug response. So if your drug works through the kidney, the EGFR is very likely to determine how well it works. Or there might be clinical features altering drug clearance. Glybenchamide is cleared by the kidneys, so if you have renal impairment or even slightly less well-functioning kidneys, you will have a higher level of glybenchamide and a better response. And the same, those features will also happen on the, for the side effects. So, if we want to, really what we felt was that the thing that John was going to do was to say we're really interested in treatment response. We want to know the best treatment. And this is based on the fact that at the moment, people with type 2 diabetes, there are no clear indications about which drug should be there unless you've had a heart attack. So really, and it's nice to propose that they have an equal effect on lowering the blood glucose. What we were able to show was they might be equal overall, but if you were to look at individuals, they would differ. So what John did was to make prediction models for all the common oral therapy and allow that to predict the best treatment. The other thing that we were able to do was to look at side effects. And again, so SGLT2s put more sugar in your urine, that results in more thrush. But it's not equal you are far more likely to get it if you're female rather than male. And if you've had thrush before, that dramatically increases compared to if you've not had thrush. And so it's not an overall risk of 5 to 8%. For some people, it will be a risk of 35%. For others, it will be 2%. And what you need to do is to make that decision based on, on, on your specific choices. There is another problem here, which is, which is the worst side effect. So sulfonylureas result in hypoglycemia, which can definitely interfere with your driving. Thiazolidines result in weight gain. DPP-4 result in GI side effects, particularly nausea. SGLT2 give thrush and make you pass urine at night. What you'll find is that doctors are very good at saying for patients which one of those is worse, but I would argue that it really is very hard for anyone to say which is a worse side effect. Obviously, a patient could prioritize, and if they had a job that involved driving, they might say, well, the last thing I can do is go hypoglycemic and therefore make that choice. But the other thing you can do is to look to see when people stop the medication using data approach to say how many people stop in the three months, because stopping in that first three months will be because of side effects. And then you can look at the impact of those. So really, that's what we're doing now, is develop, 
John has developed a model which loses the basic clinical features that's available for every single patient who sees a GP in the UK. And by using those things, you can determine not only treatment response, but also likely side effects. The advantage of using those to model with, rather than some fancy biomarker that might be scientifically a lot more attractive, is that every single patient has got them. So therefore, it can immediately be implemented at no cost. So we developed all this stuff in clinical data and trial data. At the end of the day, there was a real problem. We hadn't done a clinical trial. And that was really the, the final step that we needed to do. Having just completed that, I know why we hadn't done the trial. I have enormous respect for anybody who does trials. It is phenomenally difficult. But we decided it had to be done, so we wanted to test two simple hypotheses. And they were simply that there were BMI strata that we could look at so that people who had a BMI over 30 would be better taking pyoglitazone, whilst those under 30 would be better taking citagliptin. And then EGFR, how the kidney works, strata there, which again said that within the normal range, the people whose kidneys were working better would do better on an SGLT2, um, whilst those with a, a, a lower um, EGF, sorry, those with a lower EGFR would do better on citagliptin, those with a high normal EGFR would be better on canagliflozin. But we needed to do a trial to test that. Stratified medicine is a really difficult thing to run trials in. If you do stratified approach versus conventional, there is very little discordance. So you've got a real problem because the power of your study needs, is, will be greatly reduced. What we decided to do was to do a crossover trial. There are issues with that too, and it certainly meant that we couldn't have a long period. But the idea was that we would test both hypotheses within a crossover trial where people who had poorly controlled type 2 diabetes were randomized to one of three different orders. And they would receive, in different orders, pyoglitazone, citagliptin, and canagliflozin. At the end of each 16-week period, we would check their HbA1c, their weight, and we would ask them their side effects and whether they would consider taking this drug long term. If they didn't like a drug and couldn't tolerate it, they would go straight on to the next one. At the very end of this study, we were able to take them and give them back their own information, their description of their side effects, their, their weight and their HbA1c, and ask them which drug they would like to take long term. We then fed that information back to them and to the GP, which drug it was, so they could then continue with that long term. What we saw here was when you look at HbA1c across the trial, that the three drugs showed complete equipoise. So the HbA1c was identical on the three drugs, indeed, as NICE had, had correctly summarized from large amounts of trial data. But our hypothesis was that within that, there were people that did better, and that was confirmed. So our primary endpoint was that patients with a lower BMI would, would do better on, sorry, a higher BMI, that's the wrong way around, would have a lower HbA1c on pyoglitazone, whilst those with a lower BMI would have a, a lower HbA1c on citagliptin. So I apologize, this is the wrong way around, so that we're no, the, the diagram is right, it was the title that's wrong, sorry. <laughs> so the, the BMI, when it's low, favours citagliptin, and when the BMI is high, it favours pyoglitazone. So although the drugs are overall equal, if you divide by their BMI, you can get a better response for the patient by choosing the appropriate drug. And when we look at EGFR, again it confirmed the hypothesis, the low normal EGFR favoured citagliptin, the high normal EGFR favoured canagliflozin, the SGLT2 that works through the kidneys. So really, this was a small effect when you do it as a binary, but if you look at it as a linear characteristic, you can see that actually it's directly proportional to the BMI, so the higher the BMI, the more you're favoured with pyoglitazone, the lower with citagliptin. If you contrast kind of 27 with 37, you'll get a difference of about 10 millimoles per mole. Again, with EGFR within the normal range, this was less steep, but again, there was a range across it. So those at 60 
uh, compared to those at 20 would be a difference of about 8 millimoles per mole, so the equivalent of a whole second drug. But really, for me, the really interesting thing was what did the patients prefer? This was a unique opportunity because the patient had tried each of the three drugs. And unlike other trials, they tried them blinded. They didn't have the doctor telling them this was the best drug since sliced bread or they wouldn't like this drug because it would give them thrush. They just tried them. And what they were effectively doing is an N of one trial where the patient tries the three therapies. At the end, they were able to give their preference. And really, there wasn't likely to be an overall winner. The HbA1c was equal in all three. The SGLT2 inhibitor had the most side effects. The thiazolidine dions had the most weight gain. The DPP4 was discontinued the most. So what was interesting was which did they choose at the end of the trial? And the interesting thing was that there was a slight preference for SGLT2s, but really the striking thing is how similar. But you've got as many as 26% choosing the least preferred drug, and it's only 39% choosing the most preferred drugs. If you believe in evidence-based medicine, you say this is statistically significant, and we're going to give every patient canagliflozin, because that's what 39% wanted. And that would mean 41% were not on the drug that they preferred. And I'd argue that if we're talking about personalized medicine, then really that's what we want. And this was a mixture. 51% were choosing the preference because of positives for the drug. 39 chose because of a lack of negatives. And 10% were hard to classify. So it was a mixture. But this was striking. This now takes the people who preferred pyoglitazone, the people who preferred citagliptin, and the people who preferred canagliflozin. And what you can see in the light blue shading is those who prefer pyoglitazone had the lowest HbA1c on pyoglitazone. Those in the yellow shading had the lowest HbA1c on citagliptin. So those were the ones taking citagliptin. The ones who preferred canagliflozin had the lowest HbA1c on canagliflozin. Interestingly, when we looked at side effects, we found the same pattern. So the people who preferred pyoglitazone had the least side effects on pyoglitazone. The people who preferred citagliptin had the least overall side effects on citagliptin. Those who preferred canagliflozin, the least side of effects on that. And really, we had expected weight was going to be a major determinant of all this. But interestingly, weight didn't appear to play a role, because in every single choice, whether you prefer, even those who preferred pyoglitazone put on the most weight with pyoglitazone. And that was actually true in all groups. And so they were picking up something other than what was measured by weight. So what I would suggest is that early, if we want to do personalized medicine, we should let the patient decide, and maybe let the patient decide after trying the drugs in chronic conditions where that's possible. We've really got a very, there was no preference for one drug. Preference associated, they went to ones with the lowest HB and the fewest side effects for that person. And really, the person is the best person to balance the side effects against the positive effects that they feel. And maybe for type 2 diabetes and other chronic disease, when there is no clear indication for one drug, why not do a clinical trial of four months of each and let the patient decide at the end of that? Maybe that is the ultimate personalized therapy and also ultimately the, the ultimate found science where people are finding out for themselves what is suiting them the best. So really what I've showed is that whilst defining discrete subtypes of disease works really well in monogenic conditions like MODI and neonatal diabetes, it's really hard in type 2 diabetes and there aren't clear categories that tend to be more non-causal and, and overlapping. And we, we suggest that it's best to use continuous models and try and make discrete outcomes. But really what I'd like to leave you with is that what I've tried to show is that personalized medicine needs both hypothesis-led and all, led science, but also found science. And I'll just leave you with the words of, of Graham Rich, who painted the picture on the right, which is that the found is more powerful than the made. Maybe those unexpected findings that we find should really be the things that we look at the most. 
just leaves me to thank the superb team in Exeter. It's been an absolute pleasure. I cannot thank them enough, particularly Sean Ellard, who did all the molecular genetics and set up the lab. And then we've had a really brunch of smart people. Our first PhD student was Tim Frailing, who now is leading all the polygenic work. Uh, and that side is, is thriving as well. And we've had ever-increasing numbers of smart young people coming through. We couldn't have done it on our own. Massive help from people throughout the UK, particularly in Oxford. Fran is there, but many, many others that are here today. Also, international, the international team have been absolutely central in, in, in much of this work. And then there's the kind of people that have supported this by funding. Diabetes UK were the only people who would give us any money at all when I first went to, uh, went to Exeter. And I'm very grateful that they did. We've managed to build up from there. But really, the most important thing goes to the patients. And I'd like to thank all of them for all their help with our research. Thank you very much.